We're broadcasting. Welcome to the Center for Global Enterprise Global Scholars Expert Connect Series, leading the digital supply chain. My name is Ira Sager. I am Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise. This is the fourth in our series of six Expert Connects on the digital supply chain. In today's session, the second on digital supply chain technology enablers, we explore another important technology trend, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Before we start, a few housekeeping notes. <clears throat> there will be All right, now that I have my mute button off. <laughs> Welcome to the Center for Global Enterprise, Global Scholars Expert Connect Series, leading the digital supply chain. My name is Iris Sager, and I am Vice President of Global Learning Initiatives for the Center for Global Enterprise. This is the fourth in our series of six Expert Connects on the digital supply chain. In today's session, the second on digital supply chain technology enablers, we're going to explore another important technology trend, artificial intelligence and machine learning. But before we start, of course, there's a few housekeeping notes. <clears throat> Next week, there will be no Expert Connect because of the US holiday. We will be back on July 10th at the same time for a discussion on another critical component of the digital supply chain, and that is people and your talent. But today's session, as with all sessions in this series, will be recorded and posted on the CGE YouTube channel. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a slide with the upcoming schedule for additional Expert Connects, the two more that we have in this series, as well as a link to the Digital Supply Chain Institute website for more information. We encourage you to both uh, come back for the other two uh, webinars and also to go to the DSCI website for additional information. We will leave approximately 15 minutes at the end of the session for audience questions. You will also be able to uh, give us questions throughout the uh, presentation. You will see on your screen a little button, a feature Q and that says Q&A. Please uh, use that feature to submit your questions. We'll try to get to all the questions time permitting. As I mentioned, today's Expert Connect is about the effective use of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Our presenters will discuss how to use AI and ML to anticipate future demand and to predict the likelihood of future risks. And why all that depends on not just algorithms, and software, but on breaking down organizational silos and barriers. Uh, today, we're fortunate to have two experts with us that have experience with this <coughs> important emerging technology. Our presenter, Sean Luma, is the technology research leader for CGE's Digital Supply Chain Institute, where he has been leading our work in this space. Joining Sean as co-presenter is Pablo Zegers, founder of Aparadix, which, base, which is based in Santiago, Chile, Pablo is leading a team in charge of building advanced commercial artificial intelligence algorithms for all types of applications, but he's been involved with AI projects for the agritech sector and for contract lifecycle management. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sean and Pablo. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us on the uh, second technology session. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're going to talk about uh, today is, uh, is the impact of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and uh, why you need to consider it and uh, how it may fit into, uh, into your business model. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what's the difference between uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. Uh, those are all words that uh, they get thrown around in the press interchangeably. Uh, they really are very different topics. So Pablo is going to take us through and talk about the differences and talk about uh, breakthroughs in, uh, in artificial intelligence in uh, the machine learning uh, arena. And then we're going to talk about the, uh, the impact that the technologies will have on uh, the digital supply chain. Should be a good session. I uh, look forward to active participation and, uh, and hopefully we'll have a lot of questions as, uh, as we did during the blockchain session last week. Uh, next slide, please. Going back to, uh, back to our data model uh, that I think has been a common theme through, uh, through all four sessions uh, to date. Uh, there are uh, many new sources of data as a result of uh, the advances that technology has made, uh, the availability of, uh, of sensors in, in, uh, in uh, the Internet of Things, social media, text data, uh, images, videos, audio, uh, that, uh, 
that produces both structured and unstructured data, then that needs to be uh, be organized and uh, and cleansed and uh, and maintained. And you need to look for patterns across that data that uh, that affects your business uh, could impact your business model. So going forward, uh, data of course is uh, becomes extremely important. The reliability and trust of that data, knowing what you have. And, uh, and how to uh, how to make sense of it is important. So what we're going to do today is talk a bit about how you make sense, how you organize that data, how you how you make sense. The uh, the yellow ring really in the uh, in the middle of the slide that talks about artificial intelligence and uh, and machine learning. And of course, uh, the, what pulls it all together and what differentiates you as a business from your competitors' business is how you. Uh, employ the uh, the data that uh, is available to you, make sense of it, and uh, and that really is uh, by uh, by creating the algorithms that uh, allow you to uh, to manage your business and differentiate yourself. So in the center here, we've got the algorithm console there in blue on this slide. That is something that is uh, is very in is very important as you move forward with analyzing the data, assessing the impacts on your business, changing your, adapting your business models to the, uh, to the information that's available, changing your workflows. You really need someone to govern and guide those, uh, that information flow and the changes that, uh, that uh, are created as a result of the, uh, of the information. We think the algorithm console for, uh, is a name that we've come up with but it's something that you will find, I think, going forward in, uh, in all companies in, uh, in the not too distant, distant future. Uh, next slide, please. We, uh, in fact, we just published the results of our, uh, of our annual survey. I believe they were, uh, were published uh, uh, either yesterday or late last week. Uh, we, uh, we surveyed 112 supply chain and C-suite executives. Uh, that responded to the survey. And uh, a couple of the questions we asked is, do you feel that you need to uh, get better at collecting and analyzing your data? 90% of the respondents said absolutely, either agreed or strongly agreed uh, that that was uh, something they needed to do, uh, needed to, uh, to look at what was out there and, uh, and categorize it. Uh, next slide, please. However, 88%, you know, almost the same number that says we need to be better, says we, uh, we lack capability today and we need to dramatically improve our ability to analyze the information that's out there and to uh, deploy it in our business model and enable us to, uh, to, uh, to manage our business better and to, uh, and to shift our focus to the right places. Uh, what we call the front side, side flip, looking at, uh, looking at your customers, their needs and wants, and ensuring that the supply chain is, uh, is, is properly positioned to, uh, to respond to, uh, to their demands and needs. So there's, uh, there's a big gap. Uh, people recognize the information's out there. They're not quite sure how to use it, how to organize it, and they certainly realize that they're, uh, they're uh, not making uh, the use out of it that they, that they should be and, uh, and need the algorithms, probably need to change their skills uh, a little bit, uh, change their organizational structure in order to, uh, to uh, remain competitive in the future. Next slide, please. So let's, uh, you know, take a look at uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in, uh, in, in a perspective here. And this, this perspective came from uh, Irving Waldusky Berger. He happens to be a CGE fellow. And this is from an article that he published in the, uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, last week. Uh, his view is that, uh, that uh, artificial intelligence really is a general purpose technology. It is as meaningful, as important, and as generalized as, uh, as the internal combustion engine, uh, electricity, computers, and over time, we will, uh, we will see the, uh, the shift in, uh, in the importance of uh, artificial intelligence. What AI really does, and if you look at, uh, if you look at computers, you know, backing up a step here, uh, computers enabled uh, digital operations by enabling arithmetic calculations. 
in a, uh, in a, in a quick and predictable manner. It, uh, it reduced the cost of performing those calculations. It uh, enabled us to do things faster, enabled us to, uh, to automate those calculations. And if you look at the internet, the internet really was a reduction in communication costs in, in uh, access to information. You know, I no longer had to pick up the phone and call people. You could, uh, you could shoot quick emails. You could, uh, you could research things quickly. You could communicate far more effectively than, than you could before. Another game-changing technology. AI is, uh, is, uh, is, is no less of a game-changer. What it does when you think about it is it enables better forecasting and predictions, which enables uh, more rapid innovation. Today, uh, there's a uh, preponderance of big data. It's ubiquitous. Uh, collecting, it's a challenge. But uh, things are instrumented out there in every business process you have is connected to, uh, to big data in some way, shape, or form. Machine learning has, uh, has really made, uh, taken uh, AI out of, the, uh, out of the research room and, uh, and enabled it to uh, become a mainstream technology. Uh, because it's uh, with machine learning, the, uh, your, uh, the artificial intelligence uh, component becomes self-learning. We're going to talk more about that. Uh, you, need to, uh, you need to influence the machine learning algorithms. You need to direct them. You need to make sense sometimes out of, uh, out of what the information is telling you. Uh, but uh, once you establish a set of rules, then, uh, then the machine learning processes become uh, iterative and improve over time. Uh, AI will likely be one of the most significant general purpose uh, technologies of the century, although we're very early into the century. But, you know, much like blockchain, and I, I would say blockchain is still in, in the research phase at this point. Uh, AI is more advanced, it's more general, the use cases are more broad, but AI is uh, also in the early stages of deployment. Uh, most of what's out there, and Pablo will talk about this uh, as we move forward in his section, is, uh, is what I would call narrow AI use cases, very specific tasks, API interfaces. You, uh, you feed it information and, uh, and uh, it, it adapts and, uh, and learns on a very specific and focused uh, area. So we're in the early adoption phase there. Next slide, please. Uh, go, uh, go, go ahead and... Uh, Okay, thank you. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the technology and the technology that's become available over, over the course of uh, mostly the past decade, uh, and I think uh, Hans uh, Thaber from uh, SAP says it well, that to win in the digital economy, we have to reimagine uh, how we do everything, you know, whether it's design, uh, deliver, operate our products, what the assets are, creating digital assets, and uh, one of the things that has enabled us to do that uh, is cloud and mobility. So if you think about the, uh, the three V's that are, are continuously talked about uh, in, in big data, you've got, uh, you've got volume, which is the quantity of data and where you store it. Uh, you've got the velocity of data, which is how fast it, uh, it comes in. Is it static? Is, it, uh, is there a time delay? Is it real time? Is it streaming data? Uh, so you gotta deal with the velocity. You gotta deal with the variety of data. Uh, is, it, uh, is it structured? Is it unstructured? Uh, is, it a, is it a spreadsheet? Is it a database? Is it, uh, is it email? Is it social media of some sort? Is it a video? Uh, so you got, you got a wide variety of data that you, uh, you now have to deal with in, in the future. But really, when you look at cloud and mobility, what that has enabled is the volume of data and, uh, and the velocity of data, right? It's, uh, it allows you to uh, access data very quickly, uh, categorize it, move it around, analyze it, and, uh, and then storage is ubiquitous, right? You store it in the cloud. You've got apps that are born, uh, born in the cloud. Pablo will talk a little bit about this in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so you've got a lot of AI interfaces. You've got a lot of machine learning capability. Uh, those things are all being born in the cloud uh, where the data is, uh, is uh, more frequently residing. 
and enables you to uh, to analyze things uh, really uh, really outside your uh, your infrastructure boundaries of of your corporation. Um, next, please. With uh, with with the uh, ubiquitous data, uh, we've got sensors out there. Uh, we've got uh, automation capabilities. Uh, and so you take all those data sources that we've talked about, and it's really, this is where the variety of data comes in, right? You can think of cloud and mobility as volume and velocity. You can, uh, you can think about the sensors, the information gathering out there, the ability to, uh, to mine things that, uh, that are posted or, uh, or, or, or across the internet. That really is the variety of data that is being, the collection of which can then be automated and, uh, and transmitted uh, back, to, uh, back to the cloud. Uh, next, please. And then you've got, uh, you've got uh, collaboration. Uh, we talked a little bit about that last week with, uh, with blockchain. And, and, uh, and there's really a fourth element uh, to data. People talk about the three Vs. There's really a fourth one, which is veracity, which is how, how reliable is the data? How clean is it? Uh, uh, and, uh, and moving, moving forward, that becomes increasingly important. Uh, blockchain enables you to share data across enterprise boundaries, as we talked about last week. Uh, it enables you to collaborate. But uh, as important is the veracity that you've got some faith in the data uh, because of the consensus-driven uh, uh, algorithms that, uh, that enable you to rely on that data as, uh, as being being relatively clean or, or high veracity. Uh, and then uh, with AI and ML, uh, I think if you hit error again, there's a, uh, another header that shows up. Uh, you're really talking about uh, augmentation. So it's, uh, it's augmenting the, uh, the, the information that's out there. It's enabling you to optimize it. It's enabling you to predict what's gonna happen. Uh, with a uh, with a high high degree of uh, likelihood. Next slide, please. The point between uh, automation and, and augmentation is uh, is important. And uh, you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning are uh, much like we talked about with blockchain last week. You gotta you gotta make sure that you uh, you have a uh, a business pain point. You got to make sure that uh, you've identified the problem that you want to solve, and you have to make sure that uh, that you know the outcome you want to achieve uh, when you when you solve that. So, are you really pr improving human uh, productivity, or are you looking to minimize the involvement of uh, of humans in the process? And that's really the difference between automation and augmentation. Uh, so automation, you got things such as uh, chat, uh, chatbots for operational uh, procurement. Uh, you've got uh, defined, well-defined business processes such as those for compliance or auditing. Uh, you've got uh, autonomous vehicles that move around the warehouse. These sort of things that you're looking, uh, you're looking to minimize human development or automate the process. In the case of augmentation, you're looking to you're looking to make the uh, the humans in the process smarter, give them more information, and allow them to make decisions more rapidly, allow them to uh, to guide the uh, the the information, in, uh, and and make decisions from it. And of course, over time with machine learning, more and more of those those decisions get uh, get moved into a uh, a uh, automated uh, learning mechanism of some sort. So demand and inventory forecasting. Uh, again, this is why the, uh, the algorithm console is important. Uh, how do you want to prioritize things? Uh, what's important to your business? What are you correlating? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you feed the, uh, the algorithms? And how do you direct the, uh, the machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, capabilities that you have at hand? So again, uh, complex. Uh, but really think in terms of uh, are you automating or are you augmenting uh, and, uh, and how you're going to approach it. 
So as, uh, as we move, move to Pablo's section, he'll talk about supervised, uh, unsupervised, reinforced learning and how they're applicable to, uh, to managing your, uh, your business. Uh, next slide, please. And it's over to you, Pablo. Thank you, Sean. Hi, everybody. Um, first, uh, it's important to define what's artificial intelligence. The problem with the definition is that almost nobody knows what intelligence is. So that's why I rather use the term invented by Alan Turing, a universal machine, a machine devised hopefully to solve all possible problems. That's much clearer than artificial intelligence. And just to clarify, a robot is not the same as an AI. A robot can be a very clever mechanism that does a very complex, complex task, but it doesn't necessarily have an AI. So it's important not to confuse them. Next slide, please. Um, now, the, the thing is why it's important. It's important because it's the first science that studies all sciences. When you, when you work in artificial intelligence, you are somehow trying to make a machine that does philosophy, but also behaves like the philosopher, or um, works with law, but also behaves like a lawyer. So you're trying to mimic, to work and mimic everything related to the human knowledge and humans themselves. So it's what's called a meta science. And of course, with AI, we can produce, we can make machines that are able to perform very complex tasks. Everything that can be measured, everything that can be reduced to symbols, is subject to the study of artificial intelligence. So that's basically almost everything that's in science. Next slide, please. Just to convey a, an idea of the complexity of the field, this is much more than mathematics, much more than psychology, so sociology, economy. We are trying to model human beings. So if you start from the left on this diagram, you see that we are trying to model perception, which allows us to work with present, with the present. Almost everything that's happening now in machine learning and artificial intelligence relates to this. Then with memory, we, can, we are able to work with the past, Research now is focusing on memory, how to use the past and mix it up with the present. Also introspection or imagination, because there it's where we plan and we produce alternative futures. So past, present and future, that's the main focus of machine learning artificial intelligence right now. But it's a mixed up. Machine learning is just a subfield of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has have existed as a field since 1957. And machine learning, it's a rather new subfield of artificial intelligence. And the two of them are complementing each other. To add to this, you, you need to add all the, what's called the a priori knowledge. For example, two plus two equals four. That doesn't depend of our, on our experience. It's true anyway, anywhere. To that you add testimony, which is communication between everybody, how to grow knowledge. And finally, you need to guide everything with ethics. So that's the most complex thing in artificial in intelligence right now, how to mix ethics with these machines. We need machines that are able to behave in an ethical way. You see all the discussions about biasing in companies, uh, gender issues, everything related to those topics is extremely complicated and somehow needs to be reduced to machines. Next slide, please. This is, for those that are going to see the slides later, uh, a description of all the main fields in artificial intelligence, specifically in machine learning. You see lots of, of names like K-means, K-nearest neighbor, perceptrons, uh, boosting residual neural networks, then you have a statistical learning of Vapnik and Chervonenkis. Lots of things that are very, very mathematical. This is not like programming where you, uh, for example, you learn Python and you start uh, building up an application. And once you finish, the application will behave as you expected. This is a totally different thing. It's very mathematical, but you need to know about philosophy, about psychology, 
and mix up everything into something that has to be devised in a process that it's more like alchemy. Uh, it's more than art than a system. Next slide, please. Just to clarify things, you have artificial intelligence. Within artificial intelligence, you have machine learning. And within machine learning, you have deep learning, which is what's famous now. And deep learning is using a metaphor, like our brain is composed by neurons, biological neurons. You have a sketch of them on the right side of the screen. Deep learning uses, an art uses artificial neural networks, which are depicted in the, in the lower diagram. And then you mix up millions of them and you train them. Train them is just to, um, a euphemism to describe a process where you find the parameters that make them work together. Next slide, please. What's important is to understand why this is happening now. Artificial intelligence has, has existed as a field since 1957. So how come now is making all this buzz? Well, something happened. In 2011, things that were extremely difficult were solved in a matter of months. And three months later, things that were thought to belong to science fiction, science fiction were, had already been solved. So what happened? This was understood recently, in last year, in April, April 29th, uh, two researchers from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem discovered that, was, that there was a mathematical theorem that explained how to build complex systems out of simple ones. So this explained how we had been able to build this such wonderful and complex systems with such easiness. And what's happening now is that everybody is adjusting to this discovery. Because this is not, this is very important to understand. This is not like a mode, for example, the color of, uh, of the clothes we use or the type of car we use. That, that totally depends on our decisions. But when you're based on a mathematical theorem, this is like we've been operating on 2 plus 2 equals 5, and it was discovered that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So everybody is switching to 2 plus 2 equals equal 4 because if you operate under those grounds, on top of those grounds, you will be safer. So that, that's explaining the breakthrough we are experiencing. Next, next slide, please. Just uh, to give you a brief sense of the things that have happened, on the right side of the screen, you have an image that has been labeled by the computer. On the right hand of the image, you see a glass of water with ice and lemon. This was labeled by a computer that had never seen the image before without human intervention. And this was achieved in 2015, three years ago. Now this can be done with video and they have totally surpassed the human capacity for doing this kind of things. Next slide, please. Here you see how in 2016, a year and a half ago, December 2016, uh, researchers were able to produce fake imagery. So on the right hand of the screen, you again have, for example, flowers. On top of the flower column, you see a text. This is an artificial intelligence that just received the text and produced the, the bottom flower. So the capacity for producing totally fake images was reached one and a half years ago. And less than half a year later, the uh, researchers were able to produce totally fake high definition video that was undistinguishable from the real ones. Next slide, please. In terms of manipulation, things are more complicated because even though artificial intelligence is ready for handling very complex manipulators, the manipulators as capable as the human hand still doesn't don't stick, exist. So we cannot have the same human capacities. Next slide, please. In terms of language, this is sort of a boring example, but it's very impressive. On the right hand of the screen, you see a large paragraph on top of it. But on the bottom part of that column, you, you see a summary that was produced automatically by an artificial intelligence. 
Artificial intelligence now can understand text, not only translating word by word, but understanding the, their semantic meaning so they can produce useful, useful summaries. This, this is from May 2017, so a year ago. I think it's an example from Salesforce. Next slide, please. This is a very simple. This is Google Translate. On the right hand, you see a diagram of the neural network, the deep learning architecture that's handling only all the translations. Each of those boxes has thousands of artificial neurons that have it need to be trained in very complex computers and that many times take months of training. Next slide, please. And finally, to summarize the, the advances, here you see the Alpha Zero paper where they show, this is from last year, they show a machine that was able to learn chess and top the best humans in less than four hours, which is absolutely impressive. In just four hours, being able to dominate the field, the discipline and game that had been developed by humans in thousands of years. The machine automatically discovered most of the main uh, combinations you can learn. It could take, for example, to me, years to learn that kind of things. It only took four hours to the machine. Next slide, please. So now what you see on the commercial side, you see all type of AI engines. Everybody is trying to grab a piece of, uh, of the market. You see TensorFlow from Google, Azure and Lewis from Microsoft, Recognition from Amazon, Watson from IBM, Core ML, Apple, Einstein, Salesforce, the EPU cards of NVIDIA. Many of them are springing up, appearing everywhere, focusing on hardware, different problems, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, business applications, you see how they're pervading the market. But first, one of the most important ones are personal assistants. And here you see two major players, the Echo and Plus Alexa of Amazon and Google Home from Google. Next slide, please. In terms of the companies, you see two trends, increasing revenue, and here you see the ideas develops, developed at the DSCI, where you have to model the customers. And based on that, you measure demand, you forecast demand, you stimulate the demand, and then you control it, you manage it. Next slide, please. And reducing cost. And this is taking mainly the following approach. They are using systems called RPAs, Robotic Process Automations, um, where you can mix them up with artificial intelligence and then you're able to process to, for example, device machines, processes that are able to handle documents like people in companies. There are three major players, Automation Anywhere, Blue Prism, and UiPath. Next slide, please. The problem is the high level of the expectations. We've seen so many movies that we expect everything from artificial intelligence, but now we only have narrow AIs, AIs that are able to solve very specific problems. So before you introduce them into a company, you need to have people determine where in the company, then you need people to adapt the artificial intelligence, and then you need people to operate the artificial intelligence. So we are really far if will be ever possible, to replace all the people. We need hybrid teams. Next slide, please. This is uh, just to exemplify the hybrid teams. And an experiment done in 2013 by the Carnegie Mellon University at the Robotics Institute, where they were able to reduce the time needed to weld uh, the chassis of a Hamby from 89 hours to less than a third of the time. And in the 89 hours, they used three people. And on the other side, just a computer, an artificial intelligence, a robot, and one person. So that's an example. Next slide, please. And that's, that's your time, Sean. Yes, why don't we uh, stop here and see if we have any questions. Ira, do we have any? 
No, we don't have any questions yet, but uh, let me remind people that the Q&A function is available. If you have questions for Pablo or Sean, just uh, write in that feature and we will come there and, and uh, pull out your question and ask uh, Sean and Pablo. Okay, we'll give it just a minute here. See if any questions come in. I have a question for Pablo since we're waiting for others to enter. Pablo, um, are there any issues with standards in the AI field that um, we will uh, need to see uh, companies hash out? That's a very good question because now there is a huge fight between the companies that are building the AI engines and each of them is pushing for their own systems, trying to make them the standards. It's very complicated from our side companies because uh, now we're in a scenario where we have to use all of them. Mm -hmm. there, is, there are no standards yet. Very good. All right, we have two questions here. And uh, Renakai Lee asks, how are AI and ML related to the supply chain? And I'll uh, ask a follow-up. Uh, uh, Dimitri also asked a similar question. Do we have some examples of application in supply chain management? Pablo, would you uh, like to take that one and talk about yeah. what, you, what uh, Anastasia is seeing as you talk to your customers? Sure, <clears throat> definitely. For example, what we're seeing here in Latin America is that um, with artificial intelligence, you can measure, forecast the behavior of the customers and predict it. So immediately you can start using the results to manage the entire supply chain. It's very, very interesting because uh, normally companies have not thought about this in these ways. Uh, but with this, we are able to, to forecast the demand of people, the customers, and also the demand from the supplier point of view. So definitely, unless you're able to, you need to build this very uh, detailed, very precise artificial intelligence models of the dynamics of the companies in order to correctly uh, managing the supply chain. Good. All right, uh, Sean, why don't we continue there as, as the other questions come in, we'll, um, we'll get to them at the end of the session. Okay, all right, we can do that. Uh, although I see, uh, let's uh, answer uh, Greg's question here. Uh, he's, uh, he's asking, uh, um, are RPA tools uh, using uh, AI, which is doable today? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I'm seeing that here in Latin America. I see that uh, people are implementing RPAs and adding artificial intelligence to handle, for example, documents. They receive a document. The RPA extracts the information that goes to the artificial intelligence that takes decisions concerning the process. So, yeah, definitely. That's a yes. All right, Sean, do you want to take this okay. next question? Yes. Let me, uh, before we do that, let me, uh, let me add to, to Greg's RPA question in that uh, I uh, recently saw a, uh, a demo uh, by Budweiser where they, uh, they use our RPA to, uh, to manage the, uh, the last minute loading of their trucks when they have an order cancellation and they're looking to, uh, to backfill a, a shipment they, uh, what used to be a very much a, of a manual process, they have uh, now implemented a, uh, an RPA solution that, uh, that enables them uh, with, a, uh, with, high, with a high degree of probability to, uh, to fill the, uh, the uh, space in the truck with uh, what will likely be ordered while the truck is in transit. Uh, so that, I thought that was a pretty good, pretty good example. All right, let's, uh, let's move on here because I think uh, there'll be some more questions coming up uh, uh, on a future slide here. But uh, summarizing uh, what Pablo had to say about, uh, about AI and what it is and how it's being used and what's, what's, what the state of the art is, uh, really uh, you need to think about um, outcomes uh, that, you're, that you want to be focused on. Are you talking about automation? Are you talking about uh, augmentation of an existing process? Uh, what, is the, uh, what is the right solution? What is, uh, what is the right platform for implementing that? 
Um, we talked about, uh, about the four V's, uh, the last being uh, veracity. Uh, as, you, uh, as you embark down the, uh, the uh, artificial intelligence and augmented uh, machine learning, uh, start with good data. Start with data that you've got a high degree of confidence in, high veracity seed data, uh, that a re relatively clean data set. Uh, and make sure you've got uh, consistent feeds in, uh, in downstream supply visibility so that uh, as, you, uh, as you improve your machine learning algorithms, uh, as you improve your business models, uh, that uh, that uh, you're going against a relatively clean data set to start with, uh, so that you can uh, you can start recognizing the uh, the anomalies in the data uh, going forward. Uh, and, uh, and many of the platforms can assist you with that, but it's important to start with a uh, a, a uh, data set that you know is uh, is relatively clean. And then, of course, we talked about the human interaction, reinforcing learning models, feeding the uh, the uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, adjusting, adjusting for uh, for your uh, your business changes. Uh, if you don't know what vector auto regression uh, is today, you probably will sometime in the near future because it's uh, certainly an important tool for uh, for uh, correlating data in uh, in uh, uh, optimizing the uh, machine learning algorithms. Keys to effective implementation. Uh, operationalize one process at a time. Uh, as Pablo said, most of the uh, uh, use cases that are out there today that are generally available uh, are, are, uh, are specialized. Uh, they're narrow AI cases. Uh, look, at your, look at your process, your workflow, experiment uh, one use case at a time. Uh, as, you, uh, as you find ones that uh, are valuable to your business, then, uh, then continue to, uh, to improve those. Uh, and continue to take advantage of the data that's out there. Uh, leverage the platforms. This is a uh, this gets into an interesting conversation. Uh, in that, uh, you know, with with AI and the various platforms that are out there, with machine learning and the various platforms that are out there, with uh, with deep learning capabilities, uh, there's a lot of tools that uh, a lot of companies have spent a whole lot of time making investments in. Uh, think about where, as a company, your uh, competitive advantage comes from, uh, because that's what's important, and that's really in how you use these tools, the algorithms that you create, uh, how you uh, how you feed them. There are also open algorithm uh, uh, sources out there today. Uh, you know, I was talking to uh, one of the members uh, not too long ago, and, uh, and their view was that uh, the algorithms are a commodity. I don't necessarily share that view. Uh, their view was what's important is, uh, is the weighting that you give to the, uh, to the data that feeds, uh, feeds the models. But certainly as you move into the AI platforms and the uh, machine learning platforms, those are things that are out there. Uh, People are making investments and in, take advantage of them. That's probably not where you're going to get your competitive advantage from. You uh, you don't need to be writing the uh, the AI platform, uh, and uh, and you probably don't need an army of data scientists uh, to do that. Uh, uh, Pablo is uh, is a data scientist. Uh, he's from Chile. It's a fairly uh, fairly progressive co uh, country. Uh, Pablo is uh, is one of a handful of uh, of data scientists with a PhD in, uh, in Chile. So those, uh, those folks are, are scarce. Uh, they're gonna be leveraged across multiple companies, uh, such, as, uh, such as what Pablo does. And uh, so think about where you're gonna derive your competitive advantage from and, uh, and how you're gonna make use of the investments that, uh, that others are making. Uh, expectations are high. We mentioned that it's uh, it's early in the uh, in the uh, adoption cycle at this point, uh, but tremendous gains are being made very rapidly. As uh, as pa Pablo showed during his presentation, as he you know said, this was three years ago, this was two years ago, this is where we are today. Uh, major major inroads are being made uh, made very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so we. Uh, 
the uh, the institute published uh, published a paper, I believe, back in March, uh, talking about uh, mm -hmm. uh, talking about AI in, uh, in machine le uh, machine learning and how that uh, will apply to in effect your supply chain. It's uh, it's a it's, it's a well written paper, uh, if I do say so myself, uh, and it's uh, it's got a uh, lot of good inf invaluable information in it. Uh, I would uh, I would direct you to the uh, the institute's website. Uh, uh, if you haven't downloaded and read the paper, read it, please. I think you'll find it very valuable. But a number of things that uh, we came up with was our top 10 list. You know, what are the top 10 ways that AI and ML is going to transform your supply chain? Now, first of all is, uh, is data, the 80-20 rule. Uh, you know, today uh, your data scientists are spending things that, uh, spending the majority of their time doing the things that are least satisfying to them and, uh, and probably not a productive use of their time, which is cleansing data. So we've got to reverse this. Instead of them spending 80% of their time uh, trying to come up with uh, high veracity data, uh, they need to, need to take advantage of the uh, machine learning tools that are out there and reverse that uh, so that they're spending 20% of their time uh, teaching the algorithms uh, how to evaluate data and dealing with the anomalies rather than the 80% that they're doing today and that, they're spending the, and that they, they flip to spending the majority of their time on uh, ass assessing uh, the, uh, the data and, uh, and figuring out how it impacts your, uh, your business model. Uh, you, got, uh, you got the ability now as a result of, uh, of the data and the information feeds to uh, do real-time demand uh, simulation targeted advertising. Uh, you can do dynamic pricing much as the airlines do today. You can change, uh, you can change the price of uh, your goods and services based on the demand that you're seeing out there. As you analyze your data, you're going to say you're going to find new product opportunities. You're going to find some surprises. Um, and, uh, and deal with those surprises. Generally, it's, it's good information. Uh, you may want to adjust the way that you market. You may want to adjust your supply chain. You may want to target a new product. Uh, but that's the capability that you have in the, uh, in the digital world as you, uh, a, 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 as you uh, transform your business. V data visibility will reduce your risk. Uh, algorithms are, are important, you know, no bones about it. I, that's, uh, that's where the battle is going to be in the future. Uh, you're going to need an algorithm console or some sort of governance structure to, uh, to deal cross business units, uh, cross, cross business processes to ensure that, uh, that you're taking a holistic view of your business and adapting your models as you, uh, as, uh, as you digitize your, uh, your business models and, uh, and discover, uh, uh, changes that, uh, that that can be made. You have to prioritize that. You have to adapt your business models. You have to ensure that you're uh, you're uh, you're prioritizing the information in the uh, in the correct way, uh, and that'll become increasingly important. And then uh, we haven't talked about it uh, yet. Uh, I think we will in the next session, but uh, all this will drive changes in the uh, in the skill sets that you need. Uh, those people that you have on board today will have to change and adapt their uh, their uh, talents, uh, and you're going to need need some new skills. You're you're going to need a Pablo or two uh, to uh, uh, you're going to need a data scientist. Uh, you're going to need uh, need somebody who is uh, is skilled in managing the uh, the day to day uh, information flows. Next slide, please. So really, uh, you're going to see an intersection between your supply chain specialists, your data scientists. This is, uh, this is what next week's session is all about. Uh, you're going to have to look at organizational impacts. Uh, do you put your data scientists, uh, your data information specialists, do you put them in the business units? Uh, do, you, uh, do you organize them centrally? Uh, do you create a, uh, if they're in the business units, how do you create a community uh, cross business units of the data scientists that allow you to uh, to leverage best practices and exchange ideas amongst them. Uh, how do you integrate the uh, the new skills with the old skills, and, uh, and 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 find that intersection that enables you to uh, to optimize your uh, your HR performance. So challenges uh, challenges to think about. 
Uh, next week's session is uh, is all about this, and uh, and we'll go into uh, into a lot of detail. Uh, before we move on to the uh, to the uh, closing comments, let's uh, let's take a look and see if we got more questions here that uh, that we might want to talk about. All right, uh, let's see. Raj asks, "What is the spectrum range of applications starting from business intelligence to cognitive computing?" in the context of supply chain. Okay, that sounds like a, uh, that sounds like a master's class. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's a broad question. Yes, very broad question. Uh, Pablo, um, you, you want to take a crack? For, for example, what I'm seeing in the market are recommendation engines from the business intelligence side. Um, for example, demand forecast as well. And on the other side, cognitive computing, you see everything that's related to personal assistance and handling human, human language. Uh, I don't know. I guess we can talk about this for hours. This is such yes. a good question. <laughs> yes, yes, we could. Let me, let me ask a slightly different question, Pablo. Uh, um, Pablo works for a, uh, an AI uh, firm called Anastasia, uh, and he has a lot of uh, a lot of commercial interaction with uh, with clients around uh, around Latin America, uh, Chile, uh, Argentina, Mexico. Uh, when you go out and talk to your clients, Pablo, uh, what are the things that they are most interested in hearing about in uh, in learning how to apply to their business? Well, um, uh, that's interesting. The first thing they're secretly hoping is to uh, have a sort of a useful Terminator that solves everything. They've seen too many movies, like all of us. That's the first thing. The second thing is that they, the language has, is universal. They want to increase revenue and they want to decrease costs. So if you somehow translate the technology, artificial intelligence into that, the, we, all of us are talking the same language. So now, for example, in concerning a recommendation engine, we are running for an important company in Latin America. We managed to get a 20% increase in the revenue in the channels that where the artificial intelligence is operating. That's the kind of things they want to, to listen to. But this is important because we have to work hard in order to produce numbers because if not it turns into a political thing and ends up in i believe you or i don't believe you so they want to have numbers objective numbers that have been measured so they can prove that whatever technology in this case technology artificial intelligence is useful for them so that's the kind of things they, they want to hear. Yeah, it really is proof of value once again. You know, folks, yeah. folks aren't interested in proof of concepts. They want to know what the value is that can be delivered from a, uh, from a project or a use case. Yeah. Uh, Pablo and Sean, I have a, a follow-up question that I, I want to ask. And as you look at uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and you apply it to the, uh, the supply chain, what do you see specific jobs, functions, tasks uh, being automated? And the flip side of that, do you see new roles being created? Yeah. Uh, on my side, I see, well, first the, the simple ones, not simple, but sort of obvious, is that you need people that know more about artificial intelligence but not the details, but how to use them, to understand basically the limitations and to understand how to use them as a Lego brick, Lego brick, to assemble more complex things in the company. Then another field would be people that map typical processes into these new ones where you get these hybrid schemes with artificial intelligence and people working together. So we'll need that type of people and companies are not used to think in those ways. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I agree with the idea of the algorithm council because now companies are used to handling groups of people and technology that's fairly simple compared to this one because this one is autonomous and it's handling very complex things. So you need a different type of management. Um, also, you need people that see the companies in a horizontal way because these machines interact with the customer, um, immediately create a marketing campaign directed toward the customer, then go to the logistics section, operational section of the company and check for the stock, for example. So they cut through all the silos, the internal silos. So it will be, there is a need for people that also looks at companies in horizontal ways. Yeah, I think that would be. It. Okay, and, I, and Pablo, we've got uh, uh, another question here that, uh, that I think uh, uh, you've partially addressed in, in your discussion here, but uh, uh, Greg Millen is asking, uh, what's, uh, what's our view of, uh, of how AI evolves over time? Will we replace humans as, uh, as Jack Ma uh, uh, spoke about, or uh, will it augment humans as, uh, as Ginny Rometty at IBM uh, uh, talks about? Uh, what's your view? Ah, I've been reading a lot about that in the last years. Um, nobody's certain about what's going to happen, but I think we humans are much more complicated in some senses than, than what we, we know. And in other senses, are where we are much simpler. So some important aspects of the society are going to be replaced by machines. And I don't think others are going to be replaced by machines. Uh, creativity could be. Uh, yeah, true, a machine cannot behave like a Picasso, but definitely much better than myself. I am not an artist. So normally we tend to compare machines with the best humans in a certain field. But the problem is that all the rest are not the best humans in that field so we could be replaced by a machine. So that, that brings interesting problems, like the question is posing. Um, yeah, it's, it's still an open problem, I guess. But we're headed for a big change. That's my bet. Yes, yeah, so it really gets back to the, uh, to the discussion on automation versus augmentation and, and, uh, and, and how that changes over time. You know, certainly the yeah. augmentation automation bucket is going to going to grow dramatically the uh the need for augmentation is going to become uh um higher level i think and more specialized over time yeah uh why don't we uh move on to uh to the closing slide here uh so some closing closing comments here and and pablo let's uh let's do this uh interactively if we could uh, uh yeah. you know i think that a, a AI and you know hopefully what we've shown today is that AI and, and machine learning uh, capabilities are, are really essential to your digital transformation. Uh, it's the only way you're going to leverage the data and the sources that uh, that are out there today and make sense out of it. Uh, and uh, it, and humans can't do things nearly as as quickly or find the, find the same patterns that uh, that uh, properly focused algorithms can. Uh, consider the uh, the consider your business models. You're going to find some surprises. You're going to find probably many surprises, and you need to. You may find new markets. You may find new products that uh, that fill gaps. Uh, but uh, you know, one, one thing I can guarantee is that as you uh, as you organize and make sense of the available data that's out there, using uh, artificial intelligence tools, you will uh, you will find some surprises, and you'll need to uh, and you'll need to adapt to it. Uh, before your competition does. Yeah, I agree. You're, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a big, big believer of strategies. You know, you gotta have, you gotta have a strategy. You gotta have a roadmap. You've gotta have your preferred tools. 
uh, and, uh, and you got to consider how you're going to uh, organize uh, initially and then how that organization evolves, uh, evolves over time as, uh, as, your skills, as your skills change. Uh, obviously, yeah. when you, when, I'm sorry. I would like to complement com, uh, with something. Is that uh, concerning a strategy? For example, if you see the strategies of Google, Facebook, all the big ones, Amazon, yeah, they have they have sorted out the pretty interesting strategies, but they they still don't get it. It's even difficult for them. So if you don't have a strategy, you will be totally lost. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you. And then uh, algorithms are going to become a a source of differentiation. Uh, it's not the AI and the ML tools that are going to differentiate you. It's going to be uh, how you use them, how you apply the algorithms, uh, how you uh, how you correlate your uh, your your information to uh, to your business model and, and assess the uh, the priorities and the impacts. Which means that uh, algorithm consoles or or some form of governance is going to be necessary. We call it an algorithm console. I think it's a good name, uh, yeah. but it's uh, it's it's going to become standard practice. Pablo, closing comments? Yeah, I like the, the idea of the algorithm council as well. It's a new way of integrating all of this. Um, and I think there won't be other way. And we, we are seeing these type of changes starting to happen here in Latin America as well. So that validates it. They have given them different names, but they're heading towards the same structures. I agree. Uh, Pablo, I'd like to thank you for participating with me today. It's been a, been a pleasure. Thanks, Sean. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure as well. Look All forward right. to continuing to work together. Back to you, Ira. <laughs> thank you. And I'll add my thanks, Pablo. Uh, we really appreciate your time and your participation in this program. And Sean, again, thank you. A wonderful program. Uh, and I want to thank our uh, audience, too. And uh, as I said uh, at the beginning, on July 10th, at this uh, day and time, again, we will have our fifth uh, Expert Connect series and we will be looking at uh, talent strategy. Again, thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye.